A lot of people have asked me to re-upload my 2012 video Kubrick's Gold Story, so I've decided to post a short, re-edited version which you're now watching, and which contains some extra nuggets of information I've come across since posting the original video. The basic premise is that Stanley Kubrick encoded a hidden theme in his film The Shining regarding the role of gold reserves in US banking and monetary history. For starters, the film features a very prominent and expensive set referred to as The Gold Room, and there are bits of dialogue between Jack and the bartender regarding money and credit. But there was no gold room in Stephen King's source novel. Pink and gold are my favorite colors. Ah, well, this is our gold ballroom. Oh, I'll say. The scrapbook next to Jack's typewriter is only briefly shown in the film, but in an earlier draft of the script, Jack's presence in an old photo at the end of the film was to be shown within the scrapbook, which would then close as the film came to an end. So the scrapbook isn't just an incidental prop. And when I was shown this actual scrapbook prop in the Stanley Kubrick archives, it turned out to be full of old newspaper clippings regarding the two world wars, the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank in America, and the resulting changes in policy regarding the role of gold in US banking systems. According to Stephen King's novel of The Shining, Jack's scrapbook was supposed to be full of articles outlining the dark and mysterious history of the haunted Overlook Hotel. This is conclusive evidence of Kubrick altering the core themes of the story for his film version. More recently I had several telephone discussions with the airbrush artist who placed Jack Nicholson's photo in the ballroom picture at the end of the film and she claimed that Kubrick had his workers first decorate this huge set in silver tiles that had to be individually glued on the walls and ceiling. And then, to their frustration, he demanded they redo the entire room in gold. Now that may seem like eccentric behaviour from Stanley, but it ties in nicely with the monetary history theme. Under the US Constitution and Declaration of Independence, which is referenced by the 4th of July date in the end photo, gold and silver were deemed as the only legal forms of tender. This meant that every piece of US paper money in circulation was basically a receipt for an equivalent amount of physical gold or silver stored in bank vaults. And so, in the Shining's gold room set, the tiled walls look like stacks of gold bars. Under the gold standard, the bearer of paper money could go to the bank and redeem their physical gold, and it stayed that way in the US until the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank, after which the roll of gold was incrementally removed and replaced with paper money and computer blips that are not backed by anything. And so, Jack's 1950 issue of a $20 note is not redeemable in gold and is therefore not acceptable in the time zone of the party that he is attending. No charge, dear Mr. Torrance. No charge? Your money's no good here. orders from the house. And when he goes into the ballroom when there are no party guests, he instead asks for credit, which he is granted. Say, Lloyd, it seems I'm temporarily late. <laughs> How's my credit in this joint, anyway? Your credit's fine, Mr. Torrance. Modern, hyperinflationary fiat money, which banks just create out of thin air and then charge interest to borrowers, is all about credit and debt. That system is terrible for the population, and it gives massive economic power to unelected bankers. Looking into the production history of The Shining and the available information about Kubrick's private life, it's very clear that the director was an investor in and an advocate of gold. On pages 149 and 150 of John Baxter's biography, it is explained that much of Kubrick's wealth was stored as gold reserves in Switzerland, that his co-writer on The Shining explained that he was a big believer in gold, and it explains that Kubrick had also recommended to sci-fi writer Brian Aldiss that he should buy gold too. In the film itself, I noticed that pretty much all of the photo props in the Overlook Hotel, excluding pieces of painted artwork, were black and white, and in most shots they're either too far away for us to see the people in detail, or they're out of focus, which makes the people in them look like ghosts from the past. Kubrick also stated to interviewer Michael Simmons that the photo in which we see Jack was a real photo from 1921, in which a matching photo of Nicholson had been superimposed. Kubrick also stated that every face around Jack is an archetype of the period. 
Now that's an interesting statement because when I visited the Stanley Kubrick archives I found that nearly all of the other photos seen on the walls in the Overlook are of famous politicians, bankers, business tycoons and movie stars ranging from the era of John F. Kennedy right back to the era of Woodrow Wilson who coincidentally passed the Federal Reserve Act which ushered in the privatisation of US banking. And in nearly all of the photos, the participants were engaged either in public speeches or high society dinner parties. The elitist nature of the people in the pictures is referred to by the hotel manager, Stuart Ullman. Oh, this old place has had an illustrious past. In its heyday, it was one of the stopping places for the jet set, even before anybody knew what a jet set was. We had uh, four presidents who stayed here. Lots of movie stars. Royalty? All the best people. The jet sets were a bunch of super rich people in the 1960s who flew around in jets attending elite parties. The type of rich party crowd that Kubrick mocks in The Shining and Eyes Wide Shut. I've been unable to get hold of copies of the framed pictures because you can't just photocopy anything you like at the Kubrick archives. But one email correspondent managed to track down this picture. The woman is movie star Betty Davis and I'm not certain who the man is but he might be Robert Redford. And who do we have down here? Is this not movie star James Mason and his first wife, Pamela? Mason starred in Kubrick's film Lolita, in which he played a manipulative husband and stepfather who abuses his family. Mason was also invited to visit the set during the making of The Shining. The crossover significance between James Mason in Lolita and Jack Torrance in The Shining is already outlined in my video, Jack Torrance the Abusive Father. And it turns out that he's one of the few faces in the surrounding photos who we get a reasonably clear look at. And note that he is looking up towards the photo of Jack. But of course the picture we really want to know about is the one that Jack appears in. The one in which, as Stanley put it, every face around Jack is an archetype of the period. Now there's no reference in the archives as to where the original photo came from, or at least I was unable to find such a reference. However, there were some copies in the archive of the original photo of Nicholson before he was superimposed into the crowd. His arms were in a slightly different position, which is also confirmed by this published copy of the crowd photo, in which we can see that Nicholson was superimposed over a weird looking fella who would have stood a pretty good chance in an audition to play Nosferatu or one of the Ferengi in Star Trek. So basically, Nicholson's photo was cropped in from the neck up. The airbrush artist who placed Nicholson's photo in the crowd told me that Stanley never did explain to her the exact origin of the photo or the identities of the people in it, but she thought he might have gotten the picture from the BBC photo archives. And not being a registered journalist, I don't have access to those archives, but we do already have some good information to go on, being that all of the other surrounding pictures are of famous politicians, bankers, business tycoons and movie stars, it seems unlikely that Kubrick would just choose a picture of complete nobodies to put Jack in. Now looking at the copies of the surrounding photos in the archives, it became easier to recognise a few faces in the crowd picture. For example, here's Benjamin Strong Jr, the first governor of the Federal Reserve Bank. And here is what looks a hell of a lot like Margaret Woodrow Wilson, daughter of President Woodrow Wilson, who passed the Federal Reserve Act. And this looks a lot like another of Wilson's daughters, Eleanor Wilson McAdoo. That's a great name. Now there are other faces that are somewhat recognisable, which we'll go into in a minute, but here's where it starts to get complicated. Benjamin Strong Jr. was 14 years older than Margaret Woodrow Wilson, but he looks like the younger one in this picture. Apart from Nosferatu at the front who Jack's face replaces, very few men in the crowd are bald. In fact, many of them look very young, perhaps even in their 20s. We also don't know if Kubrick had made any other alterations to the picture. Was Benjamin Strong Jr. placed in this photo like Nicholson was, or was he actually in the original? Kubrick could have tampered with the picture in all kinds of ways. Wigs or moustaches could have been added, and famous people could have been placed in the photo, but with mismatching variations of age. As a former professional photographer, Stanley Kubrick certainly had the know-how to do such a thing. And he did confirm in an interview that he personally photographed the picture of Nicholson that was superimposed. 
He shot Jack at a variety of distances to get different grain qualities so that he could find one that matched. And we see Nicholson on set in the making of The Shining wearing a tuxedo, even though he never wears one in the film. Oh, uh, that's all right. Uh, I've got plenty of jackets. Of course, I intended to change my jacket this evening before the fish and goose soiree. Uh, very wise, sir. Very wise. Unless it was a deleted scene, this must have been taken when Kubrick was doing the photo shoot. It's also possible that Kubrick chose this photo on the basis that it contains people who are strong lookalikes for the politicians of the Wilson presidency era, or he may have superimposed lookalikes into the picture instead of photos of the original people, so as to make the final shot in the film even more cryptic. But whatever the explanation, the outcome is the same. We have lots of uncanny resemblances to politicians of the Wilson era.